Principle two is that personal invitingness. And think about the things you're doing in your school and in your classroom that give students that feeling. Let's move on to the third principle, which is the, uh, the learning environment is, is culturally and personally inviting. So this is about the environment we create in our classrooms as well as in our schools. So it's about school culture, it's about the visuals, it's about what people see when they come in your room or when they come in the school, enter that office space or the gymnasium or the cafeteria. Uh, what do people see? And I think the colloquial phrase that I like for this one is that, uh, from a student's point of view, is school looks like me. So if you're talking about a kindergartner coming in, uh, my uh, uh, granddaughter Mina, when she goes to her school, which is a multiracial, multicultural school, she walks in immediately and there's Native American images, there's cultural diversity, there's pictures of kids of all different races and cultures, nationalities, there's language differences being spoken. You, you can't move into that school more than about 30 seconds without getting that feeling that diversity lives here and it's honored. And that's what we're talking about. And think about your, your uh, school as well. Uh, some of the uh, counter examples that can happen with this one are, are when, when we don't pay attention to what's uh, visually in our classroom or the environment we're creating. One example was a middle school honor science class I was in and the teacher was doing an excellent lesson, very diverse group of kids, which was good to see for an honors class to have black, Latino, white, Asian kids all together in a middle school honor science class. But when I looked around the room, the, the pictures of scientists doing science were all white people. They were men and women, so we had gender diversity, but not racial. And so I mentioned to her afterwards that you might want to have the visuals in your room reflect who, who is in your room. And it was kind of a no-brainer for her. It was kind of like, oh, I, I, I never thought of that. It, just, it wasn't that she was necessarily uh, uh, not honoring the cultures of the kids. She hadn't been paying attention to it. So that's what I call a missed opportunity. Okay, so when you go into a building, you also might want to pay attention to your general community spaces. Often I look, talk to principals about what's in the cafeteria, what's in the office. Uh, one example of that was another elementary school that had probably, I think, uh, kids from 30 to 40 different countries in the school, many languages, a lot of immigrant students. And what they did in their cafeteria, which had been very plain, and many of you maybe have already done this, was simply to put the flags of all the kids, and they gradually built this collection of flags that would be hung as each new student came from a new culture. And as you walk in there, you honor the cultures of those kids. So this is the spaces and how the spaces reflect uh, who the students are, who the teachers are, who the community is. So when you walk in that school, you get a sense of who lives there. Even if nobody's around, you get a feeling for that welcoming, that culture safe space that my wife talked about in her classroom. So these are the first three principles now that we've looked at. Principle one, two, and three. And I want you to look at those together. And we're going to have a conversation just in dyad, just to pair and share for a, a few minutes here, where I'd like you to pair up with a partner. And I want you to address the question, what do these first three principles have in common? If you were going to make a statement about the commonality, the connection of principles one, two, and three, what would you say would be the connecting links, the concepts that hold these together? So let's go to that conversation now in your dyads. So having had that conversation in your pairs about what links uh, principles one, two, and three, I just want to make a couple of comments because you probably said things like they're welcoming, they're about climate, they're about the environment, or they're about the preset to learning. And that's the thing I want to emphasize when we're teaching across differences, particularly for students. And our main issue, remember, in 21st century schools is connecting to the kids for whom school has traditionally not worked. In other words, achievement gap issues, uh, equity issues, social justice issues, those kids for whom school was not designed to be successful, and we have more and more kids in our schools from groups who've been historically oppressed, how do we connect better with those kids? So the first three principles are what I call uh, front porch principles. They're welcoming kids into the house of learning at the front porch. If you look at school as a house of learning, that's the academics, the content, the teaching that we do, the instruction. Uh, some kids come naturally to that. They're just ready to learn, and you have students in your classroom like that. But you also know that a lot of the kids are not ready. So we have to do serious front porch, invitational kind of work, where they feel that they're being welcomed 
into the school environment and they're being invited into that house of learning that they may not come comfortably to. This is the reason that just instructional strategies is not enough. We're gonna to move to principles four and five now uh, and talk about instructional strategies and more of the academic part. But the problem in 21st century schools, if we only narrow down, zero in on instructional strategy, in many ways we miss kids who don't even wanna come in to the house of learning. And you see that happening in your classrooms. So let's move on. From the front porch, we move to principle four, which is that uh, the, the reinforcement of academic learning and, and reinforcing kids in their uh, academic achievement and their, their growth academically. Uh, my colloquial phrase for this one is catching kids being smart. And again, catching the kids who maybe don't even see themselves as being smart, catching them in the act of being smart. Now, a story that comes to mind here is an African-American colleague of mine uh, from Nebraska who tells a story of meeting uh, a teacher, and he was in the early DSAG integration movement, uh, actually the first white teacher he ever had, uh, but she saw something in him uh, that caused her to, to really connect with him and, 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 and encourage him to learn and to go on to uh, higher level courses. And this was in the elementary level. Uh, and he said that was really the transition for him. It was one teacher who saw him, and it was a, a cross-racial experience, African-American student, white teacher, uh, that, that, that caused him to actually begin to see himself as smart. So that's one example of this happening in the classroom. Uh, the other uh, things that I, I like to see, say here also is that things like RTI, response to intervention, uh, Marzano's work, many of the things that you're doing in your school in terms of uh, initiatives around achievement uh, come to bear here. There's a lot in those programs and those strategies that help us track and identify and do interventions uh, to catch kids who are maybe falling behind, but to, to mainly reinforce them in their, in their academic ability and their sense of being smart in the classroom. The principle four is about the belief in our students, the belief in their intelligence. If we don't believe in the intelligence of our kids, it's very difficult for them to believe in their own intelligence. That's not true for every kid, but for particularly those kids who are most vulnerable, who's primarily the, the, the audience we're thinking about in our work here. So principle five is about adjusting our teaching strategies and instructional strategies to meet how our kids are smart. Uh, accommodation in the positive sense, shifting up what we do to, to, to be consistent and, and related to who the kids are and how they bring intelligence. So learning style is an obvious connection here, to be teaching to the different learning styles our kids have, as well as to some of the cultural styles our kids bring in, as well as to their age group and pop culture, and being a young, young person in the 21st century, um, related very much to principle one, because if we don't understand the cultural backgrounds of some of our kids, and it, it can be very difficult to accommodate to some of the differences in the classroom as well. Now, the colloquial phrase I like to use for this one it comes from a music metaphor, which is singing harmony to our kids' song rather than forcing them to always sing our song. So it's very different. Some teachers only teach how they're comfortable. I did this in my early years of teaching, teaching Gary Howard's learning style, teaching how Gary Howard likes to learn, teaching content that Gary Howard loves, and realizing that I had to shift that over time as my students became more and more diverse and, and assuming, not assuming that they were going to be coming from the place where I was in my teaching, but they needed to be coming, I needed to be coming from the place they were. So singing harmony to who they are. In a French class at a middle school level is a beautiful example of this. Teacher teaching French to mostly Latino kids. A lot of these kids are bilingual, Spanish, English. They're learning French at the middle school level. And the teacher had them kinesthetically uh, standing up, moving to the vocabulary words, acting them out. Uh, she did music with them, so she brought in the musical side, the artistic side, the kinesthetic side, and she also connected the Spanish words to, uh, that they knew to the French words that they were learning uh, in the classroom. So accommodating who the kids are, understanding who they are, and singing harmony to the music that they bring to us. And as we look at Principle 5, I want you to also be connecting it to other initiatives in your school district. The obvious one would be differentiation, Tomlinson's work, and most school districts across the country now or into the school reform movement are uh, actively uh, focusing on differentiation in the classroom. Uh, I think it's much more difficult sometimes uh, to do that than some of the theoreticians tell us because it's difficult to teach to all the different levels in the complex classrooms we have. But what I say is in the course of a week, 
Look at how you've accommodated across differences in the course of a day, in the course of a lesson unit. Uh, how many learning styles have I connected with? How many uh, different ability levels have I offered opportunities to learn? So that we may not be doing that all the time, but in the course of a week or a month or